couple of uh, c couple of quick things before I get going. Um, just to, just to sort of get get the sympathy and the pity for you. I'm just recovering from a COVID, not COVID bout. So if I've still got a few sniffles and splutters. I'm not contagious. I'm well clear of it. But um, and the second thing is. Um, about 20 years ago, I had laser eye surgery, and they told me it would give me 20-20 vision until I started getting old, and it couldn't stop aging. And I realized now I got old because my right eye is completely going, and sometimes in spaces where there's screens there and screens there, I can't see anything. But you're all looking beautiful, um, so take that for what you will. But bear with me. Um, but yeah, I wanted to talk about um, AI because, you know, Apparently, it's quite hot right now, I don't know. Um, but more specifically about working on AI with kids and doing kids' research. Um, let me just explain all of, all, all of these different logos so you don't get too confused. Um, as Jerome said, um, I head up innovation and technology at Firefish Group of companies. Firefish is about 25 years old, mainly known for qualitative research in the UK, small US operation. Um, about 13 years ago, Firefish started a kids and teens specialist division called the Pineapple Lounge. And that's kind of who I'm talking about today because they are our kids, kids specialists. Um, in February this year, I, I launched Qualify AI, which is Firefish's qualitative AI-powered conversation platform. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but mainly what I want to talk about is what the Pineapple Lounge are calling Kids AI View, which is the kids overlay on that, on that tech. Um, so the Pineapple Lounge is, as I say, all about kids and all about doing research in the right ethical ways with children. Um, so at the heart of all of this is child's uh, safety, um, well-being, and, and their happiness to engage in research. So I'll mainly be kind of going through how we're doing that in, in a world of AI. Um, just to talk quickly about Qualify, which is, as I say, the, the platform that we've built and launched this year. Um, this is offering clients 50 AI-powered conversations with a chatbot. So 50 real people, everything powered through AI, 24-hour turnaround, any market, any language. Um, we've done about 14 so far. We've done about 30 projects since we launched it. Um, and it's going pretty well. And I think one of the things that we are doing well with it is, is making it clear to clients what it's good at and what it's not good at, right? Keeping it, keeping it kind of real. So we're finding that if you've got ideas, concepts, creative, that are relatively simple to present to someone in an explainable way, and it can then have a chatbot moderation, it's great. Um, the scale, the speed that we're getting um, is brilliant. Um, but it's not very good at other things. So when we've tried it on projects that are more exploratory, more abstract, um, such as we, had, we, we tested out an, an idea with a client about the future of ice cream, what would ice cream look like in 100 years? That's a pretty hard thing for people to get their heads around. That's where the magic of moderation and qualitative researchers can do that in workshops and bring them <coughs> out of people. AI chatbots cannot do that. Things can go off piece pretty quickly and you can't ever recover that. Or if you've got creative campaigns that need a lot of explaining, maybe there's multiple components. Again, the more you require human skills to explain and articulate and guide people through your problem, um, the less good AI is. So with that context, um, I think we found a pretty good place um, that is opening up qualitative research to our clients in ways that just simply weren't possible before AI came along. So how could all this translate into a kid's first world? I'm going to take you through some principles that we've created um, off the back of some work with, with one of our clients. But of course, before I get into that, I should state that everything we're doing um, is, is, is centered on ethics around kids' research anyway, around informing them of what the expectation is and what they're going to take part in, consent, um, and maintaining a kind of a safe and inclusive kind of culture. So the basic process we've gone through is the same as we would do in the real world, careful screening, complete transparency, and then they enter the world of, of, of the chatbot. Now, these, um, these tenants of, of, of what we've developed to work with kids, say, so this came out of some work we did with one of the major US tech providers who had actually commissioned us to run a piece of work about understanding positive experiences AI could have with, with, with kids in all that they do. So we did this research, we would employed expert interviews with child psychologists um, and, and so on. 
Um, and off the back of that, we, we've kind of come up with these six principles, and I'll take you through um, what each of those kind of, kind of mean. And then I'll tell you how, how it's actually working in real life. Um, so transparency first. So this is all about being very clear with the kids that they are talking to machines and not humans. Um, we don't want to try and confuse them, and we don't want to try and imagine that the chatbot is a human. So there's a few things um, around there. Um, openness, honesty, and a point about the human touch as well. We also talk, you know, it's very important that they understand that it's not just something happening in isolation with the bot. So we often make sure they understand that our human moderators are reading everything and will be involved in, um, in, in, the, in the project. Um, equally, there's some tips coming out of the research that, that we're like, to keep this confusion um, or avoid this confusion and keep things clear, have the chatbots trained not to, not to do anything human. So if a kid types in something like, I love pizza, don't have the bot go, I love pizza too. Because the kid will go, but you're a machine. How can you possibly eat pizza? Things like that. Never have the bot talk in the first person is another one. Again, if a kid types in things like, I'm feeling really sad today, don't respond with, I feel sad too. Because again, they'll be like, but how do you feel sad? You're a computer. And interestingly, the work we've done suggests that, you know, we're talking to kids at the moment through this method, 8 to 12. Oftentimes, we, we talk in, in, in the real world to kids a bit younger. Kids' understanding of AI and all of this stuff is pretty much on a par with their parents, which could be massively confusing, um, or it could be quite enlightened. But kids are very well versed already and understand things like chatbots, um, AI, machines. So we don't think there's, at this stage, there's any more level of explanation needed to kids than there is actually to their parents. Um, freedom of choice. Um, so this is, again, great principles around making it clear that everything is voluntary that they can, they can leave the interviews if they want to, again, just as you would do in, in, in normal research, but, but putting everything back into, um, into the control of the kids. Um, privacy and anon anonymity, um, again, classic research things with kids, reassuring them that we're only looking at things in aggregate, nothing's gonna be assigned to them, um, and, that, um, and, and that can be done both with the consent of the start of a project or, or as, we, as we go through. Um, so privacy is, is, is paramount. Um, inclusive design. So this looks at um, all the things we would do in the real world to make research kid-friendly, age-appropriate language, um, interesting, engaging questions, methods. So within this environment, we can get them to not just respond to, to the chatbot, but to upload their own materials and their own things. Um, and making sure that um, everything feels like it's real and not alien um, and not something that, that they wouldn't want to get involved in. Um, and then ease and relevance. So again, how do we make it fun? How do we make it playful? Um, how do we make put kids at ease? How do we make everything feel like a natural extension of, of how they are in, in the real world? Um, so this, this I'll come on to talk a bit about is how we're starting to train the, um, the, the platforms, um, the, the, the bots and the AI agents that we're using for this in more and more kid-friendly kid -friendly ways. So how has this uh, played out in, in the real world? <coughs> um, so these ideas around transparency and the human touch and safety and anonymity. So as I said, we're applying kid principles um, right at the point of recruiting people, um, but we're also peppering this through the kind of the automated conversation. So the chat works just like a kind of WhatsApp back and forth, um, but in all the things that we're, we're doing, we're popping in um, these reminders to the kids of some of these principles. So it starts off by saying, I'm a chatbot, I'm a chat assistant. Um, it talks about the fact that we've got human colleagues um, who'll be looking at this as well, so they know there's, there's sort of real people involved. Um, and one of the interesting things from the original research we did that, that um, the, the, with the tech firm and, and some of the child psychologists, they said it's quite important not to have these interactions be too smooth and go too fast. So actually, some little pauses and, and pacing the way the chatbot kind of displays the text 
the little dots and everything is quite good for kids because it shows them that there's a machine thinking and there's a pause and that's kind of what they're used to in, in when they interact with, with, with things online. So there's a really interesting thing here about almost um, accepting and playing up some of the, what might seem to us some of the, the sort of the weighting, the stiltedness, because if you're making things too realistic, too smooth, and I'll come on to talk about kind of avatars and things in, in, in a moment, um, that just plays into this confusion kids have of what is it. So, that, so the more that you can remind them and show them that, that there's a machine going on in the background, uh, the, 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 the better. Um, so all of that happens, um, and then as the kids take part in the research, we're often peppering back through reminders around, um, around some of this stuff um, and pausing as, as we go through. Um, the other piece is not to let these conversations go, go too long. So we've found with adults, we've done all those extensive um, projects we've done now. With adults, we're running these at about 15 minutes. Um, possibly you can push to 20. They're kind of these IDI chats. With kids, it's more kind of 10, 10 minutes. The drop-off in quality um, after sort of those time periods is quite stark. Um, and in fact, when you end up on the, on the output side, when you look at summarizations of this stuff, um, all you get is lots of transcripts in the sort of the final question going like, you know, I've talked to you about this like now the 10th time, you know, this is like repetitive. Like, so, so, so the drop-off's really quite staggering after that kind of time. So we kind of keep this all, keep this all kind of punchy um, for them. Um, the freedom of choice point I mentioned, um, so again, participation is voluntary, they're free to leave when they want, um, that's important too. And then back to this inclusive design, so how do we take um, the AI agents that are driving this um, and making them um, kid friendly? Well, there's a couple of things that, 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 that we do. So, so first of all, um, we are using our teams to design the initial interaction and the guide for the, for the agents to follow. Um, so this isn't a system where you sort of put the client brief in and then the AI has generated a guide and, and off you go. So our guides are, are, are curated by, by our teams based on how we would do that in the real world and how that translates to this world. So that's the starting point. So human in the loop at that point, we found to be hugely, hugely important to set, to set the whole thing off on the, on the, on the right foot. Um, we are now, we've, we've developed in the adult world kind of quite good discussion guides and scripts that, that um, the, the, the AI is now learning how to deliver really well. We're now uploading and training on sort of 10 years of doing this in, 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 in the kids' world too. So we're creating a, a sort of a separate kids' agent, understanding kid terminology, understanding language. Um, so far, we've only been doing, as I say, kids eight plus, and their parents have, 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 have sort of been sitting alongside them. But as we start to look at letting kids go solo on this and trying to get to younger kids, we're starting to look at um, those age-appropriate scripts um, that the AI, the AI can learn. And obviously, it learns not just the scripts, but it's learning the probes as well. So we've kind of got this constant feedback loop going of understanding from answering the question we've given the agent, the AI agent will then probe and probe on the response given, but we're obviously feeding back all the time on how well that's been doing. So we can start to effectively imagine, you know, reimagine ourselves in the real world through the, through the AI world. So that's, um, that's some, some um, great kind of work in progress on, on, on tightening all of this up. Um, so, you know, we're finding that we're getting lots out of the kids doing this, um, just as you would in, 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 in the real world. We're tending to that sort of 10 minute window we've got, we're finding we've got about time to do about 10 questions. Each question will come with a probe that the agent has done. So we're getting kind of 20 of those and we're doing about 50 kids at a time. So in a standard project, we're giving people kind of a thousand spaces, if you will, to create the data set that we can then use the AI on the back end to, to, to summarize. Um, so really rich and, and, and really fruitful. Um, thinking ahead, there's still obviously, this is real you know, work in progress, um, and we've just got going on these pilots with, with some live clients for, for, for kids. So what are the continuing challenges that we're working on? So as I said, at the moment, we've gone through a process of ensuring 
the parent is next to, to the kid. Um, so when we screen through, the first question actually gets them to upload a video of them and their kid about to take part. So that's the best way we've found so far to verify that the parents and the kids are there. Because one of the things we know for sure is um, parents like putting their kids into research to get some money. And then it's very hard to control, obviously, in an online environment, especially if you're doing quant surveys or other things, is the kid actually there? You're always looking for that. I think one of the things we've been looking at is how we can detect that more in the outputs um, and looking again at, at training the agents on the kinds of transcripts and the kinds of conversations we've had in the past 10 years in the real world and picking up those kinds of like age appropriate speeches, prose, how they construct things and that. So, so that is an ongoing, an ongoing thing for that kind of quality control. But some of this at the moment is still you know, a little bit manual intervention. But that, that notion of getting the kid's voice coming through is, 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 um, is, is huge. Um, at the moment, as you saw in some of the, the, the slides there, is text chat, which is great, until we do a lot of work with pre, um, younger, younger kids, um, even, to even some kind of pre-verbal kids, which is always quite fun in the real world. We are launching voice um, in the next couple of months. Um, and we think this will really open up for kids. I mean, it's going to open it up not only from a validation point of view, because the kids can never just talk, but from an answer point of view, um, being able to just verbalize their responses to everything rather than typing. Now, kids typing, um, certainly for the older kids, is, is actually much better than parents, because that's what they're being brought up on. So when we're talking to 12, sort of 16-year-olds, their, their typing and their texting is fine. But voice just will open it up, make it easier, make it will get a lot lots more richer stuff out of there. So this will be initially voice, AI, reads, converts that to text, and then responds still in text. We're starting to look at voice to voice, and we're starting to have a look at avatars. But at the moment, there's a couple of issues. It still feels quite stilted, that, that, that whole area. And also, as I said, one of the key, the key things at the start, the more human-like we make it, actually, certainly for young kids, will lead, seems to lead to more confusion about whether they're talking to AI or human, and we want to keep that pretty clear and pretty, pretty transparent. Um, and then, as I said, um, length is, is, is a challenge um, because of that drop-off in quality, um, and this is constantly a challenge to clients who totally buy into all these principles until they send you, you know, a four-page discussion guide with about 100 questions. Um, what we're also talking about, a bit like we talked about in the adult world, is kind of a horses for courses thing of like, where is this good for, for kids and where isn't it? And it all comes back to the brief and the questions the client's trying to answer. You know, the more complex things are, and the more you feel you need humans involved to explain ideas and make sense of things, then, um, you know, the more likely it is that you should be doing old school proper research and not, uh, not going down this route. Um, but we think if we keep coming back to these values, however this journey develops, keep coming back to this idea of our commitment to, to kids doing research in, in sort of happy and healthy ways, informing them and their parents, respecting their time, respecting their age, keeping them in control of the process, then, then this should be a really exciting journey to, to, to go on. Um, interestingly, a few things as we, as we look ahead, in, in some of the feedback sessions we've had with parents in doing this, um, some of the parents have articulated that, look, I, we've got to equip our kids with these skills for the future. We don't know about this world very well. So actually, little interactions like this, experiences like this, of, of, of having a positive experience with, with, with AI, with a chatbot, in furtherance of, uh, of giving their opinions about brands and products and things they like, is a good part of their kind of journey in education. Um, and building the kids' confidence that, that these can be positive experiences. There's, there's enough doom and gloom around that parents and kids see. Um, but this is another way we think that is just kind of give building, building skills and confidence. Um, and as I say, continuing to think creatively about how we do better research in, in real life and how that translates to, to an AI environment will we'll continue to be at the forefront of what we do. Um, you know, if you look at a timeline of all of this, you know, since ChatGPT came along and opened this whole world up to, to, to a year of sort of testing to sort of three or four months of live adult stuff to now probably about a month of kid stuff, we're, we're only just at the very beginning and 
This is not a presentation that says, here's the answer, we've cracked it, but hopefully there's some useful stuff in there and thinking about this world and thinking about how to adapt it for doing kids' research as well. Thank you. I, I have a question. Um, kids are playful. I, I'm a big kid. Um, the first thing I do when I meet a chatbot is I tr try to make him say outlandish things about Adolf Hitler and Taylor Swift, possibly together. Um, so, uh, did you, you know, how do you prevent that happening? You know, or, or is, is it preventable? Do kids do that? Or they, they treat the, the exercise seriously and, and answer those questions earnestly? Um, so, so I think the, the, the key to it we've found is we're not, um, as, sort of, as I mentioned, we're this sort of not an open conversation of like, you know, chatbot goes, tell stuff about Taylor Swift, the kids got going. It's quite a tightly defined thing. So we start with a, with a guide. So we've, we've, we've got kind of a, a guide, just as you would in, in, if you were doing some IDIs with kids. So it's quite a tight set of parameters. And then at the moment, the agent is kind of feeding off what they respond to in terms of that um, initial question we want answering. And they'll, so if you ask about Taylor Swift, they'll type in their answer. The agent will then probe a couple of different ways on a couple of different things they've said but then it will come back to the next question we want to answer. So there's stuff in the, in the agent that looks at if they're very monosyllabic and it'll push them, it'll look for gibberish, and all the good quality control stuff there. So there's a little bit of that, of playfulness, but we're probably still very much erring on the structured, more cautious side of it so that things don't go off too far on, on a tangent. Andrew. Hello. Um, so I've got a maybe a stupid question. Why bother with AI if you've got a moderator? What's the end goal? Why do you need AI to talk to kids? So, so this kind of the same question, I guess, could ladder back up to adults. So, at the heart of what we, of the opportunity we see is, um, and I went to the MRS conference, and there was a great paper by um, ABI in Bev where they're taking, a, they're taking a research project and then they had a whole bunch of their internal stakeholders basically rate an AI and a human report. Um, and in that, it ticked all the what they were judging on, like strength of insight, novelty of findings, all of that stuff. It was like, oh, the human one was way, way better. And it led to that same thing, like, oh, why bother? But if you actually, and I think this is so, so the debate around AI versus human is slightly off. My view is more, you know, what can AI, let's level that playing field of that debate. So what AI can do is speed, cost, and scale, right? So for the right kind of project, sometimes clients want to talk to, so, so, you know, for us, we're like, I want to talk to kids in four, four markets, but the question on the table maybe doesn't warrant a big, expansive research project. Maybe I want some kind of fast feedback on, on some ideas in four markets, and I want to speak to 50 to 100 kids per market. That just becomes impossible as a piece of work you can do in the normal way with moderator, moderator. Moderators can't moderate 100 IDIs overnight in, in four languages. So that's where we're going. At the moment, you go, this is impossible. And, and a tagline to our whole sort of AI business is making the impossible possible, which is like, that's the reason you would do it. Because otherwise, you'll get no insight, um, and you've got to go with your gut. So. In a, in, a, in, a, I suppose in, a, in, a, in a perfect world of like, I've got a big meaty strategic question, it's, it's more complicated, and I've got time, and I've got money, because it's worth it, absolutely. Like, you know, why would you do this? But in so many cases, clients don't have the time and the money, and this is a way of doing that and getting them something which is kind of better, better than nothing. Um, and the way I think we're trying to do this, and we're sort of, but still basing it on our kind of 20 years of doing great qual, is trying to go, your choice at the moment are slow, expensive, or sort of, I guess, a pure AI, superficial, reductive, and probably not that useful. Can we do something in the middle that still has value? And that's where we're kind of anchoring this. Thank you. 
have two questions, please. Yeah. So is that your proprietary chatbot, conversational AI system, or you're working with a partner? And my second question is around voice and voice to voice you, that you mentioned. Is there something that you're piloting currently? Could you tell us a little bit more about what the pilots are like and how you're testing voice specifically? Yeah, um, so the first, um, since the first question is kind of, uh, we've, we've started this journey with sort of out of the box third party software, but for, for us, what we're trying to, where we're going is building, um, building and training our own versions of that because what, you know, a lot of the out of the box stuff is great especially on the summarization side, right? It's, it's great at summarizing, but it can come back quite generic and quite bland. And we believe there are certain ways in which Firefish and the Pineapple Lounge moderate and analyze that is what's built, built the business. So we're actually looking, looking now and working on training, you know, training it in our own image, as it were. So yes, third parties now, but we hope in, within the next eight to 12 months, to, to basically have our own proprietary system that's, that's been informed and trained by 20 years of doing this really well. Um, to the second question on, on voice of voice, yeah, we, we essentially at the moment we've just been doing trials with, with some um, same kind of flow and same system, but just plugging in a, a, a voice um, so people can speak. As I said, the, 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 the agent turns that voice into text, responds in text. Um, had a little play, so we just play around the accuracy of that. That feels, we feel quite confident we'll be able to launch that soon. The voice to voice um, is, is, we've had a look at, we're still probably parking that for a little bit because um, back to this idea that it still feels a little, it still feels a bit too weird to create a kind of a nice human back and forth, which is what we're trying to replicate as much as we can. Um, a, a keeping kind of a, the way, what is qual, qual is a human conversation. So, so, that, so for voice, we're just, we're just at that one, just to allow people to talk, but yeah, I'll still respond in text right now. Quick one. Uh, yeah, quick one. Um, I was just gonna say, I mean, you mentioned um, uh, the sorts of types of projects you don't think it's very good for, for like just generally research. Are there, any, are there any types of projects or topics that you just can't see you'd ever want to do with kids um, at, in an AI world? Um, I mean, I think, I don't know if it's necessarily an AI world. I think there are projects we do that are more, you know, ethnographic, co-creation type stuff where you want to, you know, you want to be inside kids' homes or you want kids creating the future of something with you. Um, so again, I think those projects where the physicality of the experience, clearly, whether it's AI or not, it's just, you can do, you, know, you can get people to upload collages and things on, on online, but it's just not, yeah, it's, you're just not gonna get as much rich stuff as, as you would. I think as well, you've got, from an AI point of view, like the interaction we've seen with, with, with bots, like it's, as I say, it's like text to text, voice to voice, what it can't do at the moment, at least I've not seen anything, is like, you know, if kids are uploading pictures, that the AI can then like understand that picture and then comment on it. So, so I think we're, we're, we're sort of a long way from being able to replicate that. But again, I think for the, for, for the kind of brief way, it's just like, I want to experience kids' worlds, and, you know, the more physical and human the, the method. And I kind of almost, our team will kind of write that first and go, here's the brief, what would I do? Does AI have a role? And probably at the moment, eight, nine times out of 10, it's like, but it just starts to feel clunky, I'm forcing it in, so, 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 so let's not. Rich Owen, uh, the Pineapple Lounge, thank you very much. Thank Fantastic you. presentation.